consolidation and it caused the odds to explode but we'll get into all of that in a minute we have some great speakers coming in feel free to request up and join the panel leave your questions and thoughts in the comments i promise i will be checking them i'll give you a shout out if you have a good question for us but guys guys let's waste no time Aaron, what is up why are my bags pumping hey hey um there's a few different reasons sorry that's the cops outside my window um if you can hear them but uh there's quite a few reasons our bags are pumping i mean i've reevaluated my own bitcoin investment thesis this cycle my own ethereum investment thesis this cycle you know that's important to do if you're a investor in the market why do i think bitcoin is going to be higher in the future or ethereum or whatever it is and then whether the price goes up or down you can still um you know get peace of mind because your investor's thesis hopefully hasn't changed so i've recently reevaluated mine i think there's plenty of reason to think that both bitcoin and ethereum baseline uh there's higher highs to go this cycle and you know my overall thesis is we just need either bitcoin or ethereum or both to go up for crypto at large to do well for old coins to pump because there's always going to be that wealth effect you know people are always gonna as bitcoin and ethereum or solana chain link whatever it is rises feel wealthy and feel like oh i could be getting much you know how much higher is chain link gonna go after two hundred dollars i could be getting much bigger gains uh in this uh coin in the in the pulse chain ecosystem right gary or whatever it is um so you know again my point is that my my thesis on bitcoin and ethereum remains strong we can talk about it here and uh you know i'm still bullish on this market tina thank you so much and let's go to adrian i kind of want to just get your outlook of the market right now are you also changing your thesis <laughs> hey right on thank you tina uh good to good to meet you everybody my name is adrian adrian i'm a cmt charter market ignition don't know many of us in the world which sucks i'd love to uh, i'd love to to kind of like just be able to spread the word around more quantified, more evidence-based, more number-based technical analysis rather than some random squiggle lines from scammers. That is, uh, that internet is full of, right? We're full of information that is not credible and it sucks. And it sucks not only because, well, there's lack of information, it also sucks because we are pushing the people in the wrong direction. So I'm kind of like trying to contribute with, uh, with my accreditation into into this world with with a little bit more reliable information and that's me checking the charts right i'm a chart guy and i'm a chart guy i'm a trend follower i follow the trends and there is a difference between relying on guessing the future that is unpredictable and some set of squiggle lines and, and some random shit coins just making a bet and then believing you were right even though it was unpredictable you know there's a lot of there are a lot of behavioral biases that we all suffer from the cognitive dissonance they are the ones that are Cognitive, there are the ones that are information processing based. they are also the ones that are spontaneous and very hardy. We can control them, right? Their emotions. And uh, what I what I think we're talking about is the whole buying frenzy. You know, it always comes up the biggest at the top, right? The selling frenzy happens at the biggest at the bottoms. And uh, what happens is that 70, 80 percent of the time, crypto just chops around and sideways, right? So this is a safe, well, not a safe haven. This is a kind of like a good situation for those who are mean reversion traders, for, for those who trade swings, right? And the market swings back and forth between fairly established range of highs and lows. And that is approximately similar, right? For Bitcoin, that was the half a, half a year range between twenty five and $32,000, something that actually broke out to the upside. Crypto burb, crypto burb. Before you continue, and I'm, I don't want to miss a second, just for, so everybody's on the same page, what, what, what exactly are you uh, iterating to us right now? Something bullish, something bearish. Right on. So um, this is, I'm a trend follower. Like I said, I'm a trend follower. I follow the trends. Trends are up. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm following the trends. However, me being bullish or bearish doesn't define my trades. My trends, my trades can be opposite to, to what my, call it opinion or the market stances. I don't trade my, I don't trade on opinions. I trade on facts, numbers, trends, figures, um, and something that is quantifiable, right? My opinions, I'm wrong for 50,000, say they, you know, I don't see any reason why I would be guessing 100% right everything, every single thing. You follow the charts, and if the charts change, you just update your opinion. You don't get emotional about it or anything. You just look at the charts and say, this is what the charts tell us. 
Well, almost to an extent, to, to such an extent that I don't have an opinion about the market, right? I, I don't, I don't, I couldn't care less about my opinion because I'm wrong most of the time, and it's impossible to roll a dice and keep guessing, you know, every single time the future, right? So, what I'm doing is I'm taking care of the long-term charts, and there is Gary. Good to see you, Gary. Uh, long-term charts. I'm, I'm, I'm using data and statistics, you know, and uh, using the averages, the long-term averages out of the large sample of data is basically a good a good and the only estimation of, estimator of, of the, let's call it true value, even though the markets don't have true value. Um, so relying on the averages, relying on the indicators is something that I quantify the risk. And it doesn't matter which direction it is up, up or down, right? The trend right now, trends right now are, are up. The 200-day moving average that is a dominant trend line uh, there's not a single person safe saying in mind that would argue that it's going up for like a year already and uh, It's it's not our opinion that matters. It's the market literally telling and aggregating that and showing the path and the path is upwards And well, Adrian man, I am so glad you say those things because uh, People might not know this but you signed up with quantum which is a company I'm a part of so Deep down, what I'm hearing is that you do believe in the miners and this thing is going to go, you know, somewhere ultimately. And the long term game matters, right? I mean, like you said, it doesn't matter if you're bullish or bearish uh, long term, you can still trade whichever way. And it's really a matter of knowing where you stand um, when it comes to the charts. Like it might be moving down right now, but ultimately we do have a positive outlook in this market. So that's that's what I took out of what Crypto Burb said as well, that. He prefaced it a lot, but ultimately the conclusion was the charts are pointing up. But while we're on the chart talk, I did want to also ask Crypto Burb um, in terms of the halving, because you guys are right, the sentiment is great, and you know, like there's been a noticeable increase in addresses holding actually over a thousand Bitcoins. So rails are getting longer, long term holders are actually l holding very long term. But I'm wondering, um, Adrian, when it comes to, you know, we're coming up with the halving, the halving is probably around two months. Do you also, you know, take what do you think based off of the charts and what you've seen previous cycles? Are you trading the having um how are you going about it you're right on uh thanks and and and, and i do want to highlight the, the the highlight uh the shout out again to quantum expeditions you're right my friend a uh, good question tina thank you so regarding the holding again i'm not going to give you my opinions because it's irrelevant right uh I'm, i can come in on the facts something that had happened on the left hand side of the chart that's not something that can be refuted because it's a fact right so i, I prefer to rely on the facts much more on the something rather than something that is unpredictable. So speaking of the facts, we've had, we've had three, three halvings, right? The halvings happen protocol-wise every 210,000 blocks. This rounds up and takes us to the fourth halving summer mid-April, for now it's somewhere between 14th and 16th. It floats and fluctuates, the closer we get to it, the more likely we land at one date. Uh, speaking of the facts, we are talking about uh, two significant or three significant observations. First, first of all, those holding cycles, if you will, that are block-driven, not time-driven, they're block-driven, they tend to align very well and correlate strongly with the overall stock market, presidential stock market cycle. That is four-year, right? So we have the superposition of the four-year holding cycle and a four-year presidential stock market cycle as well. So there is, a, there is the superposition, in fact, that I can develop and delve into briefly, shortly. Uh, there is alignment between how the stock market moves and how Bitcoin moves, right? And it doesn't matter really why it, why it is this way. It actually is this and, and this way, and that's that's what we need to accept. Now, on another note, Bitcoin, after every single rally, um, after every single halving, for many different reasons, there were very strong rallies. We're talking nine thousand percent on the first halving, post a post. post first halving all the way to the to the subsequent peak. Uh, typically, typically what we see after the Bitcoin halving is in the span of 9 to 11 months after is when Bitcoin breaks all-time highs and when Bitcoin eventually tops out for the cycle. That's just typically what we've seen. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so you, you're looking at 9,000% gain on the, on, on the first halving to the subsequent peak. You're to, then looking at the second halving peak to the uh, second halving to the subsequent peak. Of three thousand percent, right? So ninety x, thirty x. Then the following one, post May, twenty twenty, post the March crash, we're talking about seven x, seven hundred percent, right? 
So right now we're talking about the market that is size of 1.6 trillion or more and growing, right? The market is up significantly almost by 200%. I'm talking about Bitcoin, almost 200% since the bottom uh, came in. We're talking about the fair relative outperformance of Bitcoin versus altcoins. So it's clearly leading the way and I'm talking numbers. I'm talking 85% since the breakout point of reference versus altcoins 15% as a as a total uh, market cap less Bitcoin. So there's strong distant leadership from Bitcoin, which is okay and it's typically and it's typical of the early stages of the cycle. Uh, however, what matters even more is that Bitcoin, this is the fact number three, it never returned to the holding prices. Right? So everybody who bought on the halving basically are in profit. And for most of the time, they are in extremely heavy profit. They're on 9,000 profit, they're on 3,000 percent profit, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, there, are, there are facts and numbers, uh, facts and numbers confirming that even though we don't know the future, we might hold on to an anchor just a little bit into something that makes sense, something that happened and something that shows up a repetitive pattern. And if this repetitive pattern is to be maintained, we, and it seems this way, uh, the market is probably up for, for some decent rallies for the next year and a half, just maybe. Uh, always breaks in your all-time highs. I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be different this time. So your opinion on the price isn't that different from mine, I don't think. Not that I've you know talked too much about it, but just generally what people are thinking this cycle. But you're even making a distinction that I don't have opinions. This is just what this chart is saying. but. Still, with that, you you are sounds like you are bullish. You know, after the having. Well, so bullish. Bearish. I mean, how bullish? Because I feel like we're, we're all bullish on the having, as we've seen how previous cycles um, turn out. But what I kind of want you guys to comment on is, people are saying this having is going to be different than the others because of the ETFs, because of the huge demand and the supply crunch and everything. So I kind of want you to guys to comment like specific to this cycle because of the new stuff that's happening and also macro and everything and i understand agent you are right kind of like it's not our opinions or feelings it's about what the charts say and what the data says but you know like there are people that are just huge like the price is going to be transformed overnight and i feel like you know usually when we all agree on something it's the opposite but i kind of want to know where your guys is um, where you stand on that or anybody on the panel mm -hmm. so um, uh, you know, this is this is true to to a large extent. However, not always, right? Because the the the, the uh, contrary opinion trading investing, if you will, is a strategy on its own. However, it is mean reversion, right? Because you assume that when when ninety percent of the people, you know, are are bullish, that is going to reverse. However, the problem, especially in crypto, that is technically driven that is behaviorally driven there are no fundamentals in the traditional sense there is no cash flow no earning reports and so on uh, there is no centralized entity behind that we we rely on the behavioral psychology um, patterns that we retain over the years right and this is something that doesn't change and what what matters is, oh, oh there you go what, what matters what matters is oh, what the heck <laughs> that's my dog man <laughs> I think my wife might be just coming in soon. Anyway, uh, so so long story short, you know the problem with the with those sentiment barometers is that you can be you can be right eventually, but by being right, you might want to hold on the opposite positions that are gonna basically cost you missing out of incredibly strong rallies. So you see Bitcoin in extreme greed, right? At thirty thousand, you saw Bitcoin in extreme greed and forty thousand. You're gonna see Bitcoin extreme greed at 150,000, just maybe when it gets there, just maybe. Okay, so cool, cool. So let's let let's let, let let's let a couple of these other people jump in. Let's go to Michael and then Gary and then just anybody can just you know interject whenever at any time during this space. If if you guys been through a having, I've been through a few. Uh, it's very boring. I, I literally have it to where it's like you invite friends over. It's like a pizza party. We're looking at the charts, and uh, Bitcoin doesn't move. Sometimes it dumps a little bit. As We're well. not having a party um, this year. Buy the rumors, sell the news, or whichever. No party, Michael. But, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure we'll have a live stream. We'll we'll have a a, a push on the live streams area. But uh, like if, if you if you've been through it, it's it's very uneventful. Um, but my personal sentiment and kind of like my personal opinion is that the having ends all bear markets. Uh, it does start the, the basically the new cycle that's going to happen with it. 
what I've seen is that usually six, there's usually two tops. Um, it's usually six months. Around the six month mark, you'll start getting, you know, either it's going to be at all time high or breaks past all time high a little bit for its first peak, then retrace. And then around a year and a half is where, for, from six months to a year and a half, there should be a second peak. And that second peak is a blow off top. And that's when it's bad news bears all over again. But everyone always says that every cycle is different. I think that with this cycle, I mean the, the upcoming cycle, there there is patterns that kind of repeat sometimes. So like the the six months to twelve month, uh, six months to a year and a half mark, you're looking at like a potential two and a half year bear. But actually, I think it's actually going to be a longer term effect of that. I think we're probably going to go into a multi year run, and then afterwards go into an even longer uh, bear market that can potentially almost last uh, until the next halving that's going to be happening with it. So I, I don't know why, but I feel like Suzu's super cycle was just a little bit early, you know, basically having it to where it was like one and a half year of bull and then three, usually three years of bear. But I think that it will probably be like two and a half to potential three uh, in terms of bull and then like up to a five year bear. But then again, we're also looking at like uh, commodities and assets going into its next secular run um everything's gonna probably hit all-time highs pretty soon for like nasdaq and everything as bitcoin kind of like runs up and, and continues on climbing with it but the way that i see it is i'm, I'm very shit at ta like i can't chart to save my life i try <laughs> I, I really really try um the way that I look at market sentiment is I, I actually view it from the marketing perspective because then I see uh, what I can do is I can see how companies spend. So whenever I see companies like, let's say, for example, Polygon just laid off like 19% of people. You're looking at like other like a plethora of companies doing layoffs right now. If you look at the layoff factor last site, um, like the last layoff cycle, it, it it was basically right before a little bit of a crash that happened, right? So even if a lot of companies right now are doing layoffs, I do still see that momentarily that there is going to be a little bit of a, of a peak down for, for everybody that's going to be in the market. And then we'll probably jump right back up and we'll break through it pretty quickly. Bitcoin is what, it, what we call the, the green dodo. It was just literally just, you're, you're at like a low peak. There's not that, that much volume. It's a weekend. All of a sudden it just jumps and pushes like five thousand dollars without you asking you know i want to go to bitcoin I want to, go to, I want to go to gary real quick to make a new comment but before that michael um isn't like companies marketing because i see the same type of stuff with companies hitting me up with marketing or you can even say the same thing about like seasonal crypto youtubers just you know getting involved they do it about the same time isn't that kind of like a that tells you oh that you know we still have half a bull market left at least but it's almost like a lagging indicator it never like starts right at the beginning it, yeah, no, so basically it's, I would say it's a preemptive indicator. So the preemptive indicator is basically, let's say, for example, during the uh, during the past year, um, Avalanche was marketing really, really heavy at events for GameFi. Like any gaming events that were there, they were there sponsoring, they were there showing up with their teams. I also saw it in like uh, Token 2049, Korean Blockchain Week, you know, all these companies that were competing against each other. But I noticed that you know, Avalanche was pushing specifically for the gaming sector. So for that, I started looking up basically gaming projects that are going to be launching on Avalanche. Um, I met up with Shrapnel before they even announced and kind of like uh, launched their, their big portions and everything. They were at Token 2049. And I asked them what blockchain they were building on. They're like, oh, well, we have a really great relationship with Avalanche. So it really got me interested in terms of like, okay, if companies are doing this as an early push, that means that their narrative or their potential upcoming narrative is going to be a push into GameFi. And whenever Shrapnel kind of came out uh, out of the woodworks, it kind of like cemented that uh, that partnership and saying, hey, look, they are pushing into that area. And a lot of like, if you look at um, DeFi Kingdoms, DeFi Kingdoms switched over to uh, to Avalanche from Harmony back in the day. They were at Harmony, but Harmony got hacked, all these things, but they switched over to, uh, to Avalanche. And even for them, that was a good, you know, 80% pump. Uh, that was able to, to, I purchased a small bag at the conference and then afterwards as well. I kind of saw that once I hit the top, I just sold out a little bit. But, you know, the gaming the gaming narrative that was happening during that time. Now, there is new narratives all the time that come up. But just being able to see, it, you know, just being able to see how the marketing is going, whether the marketing is going to be pushing towards content creators, whether marketing is going to be pushing towards events, you know, real life activations, all these things. 
you're, you're able to see it happened because they try to acquire users beforehand before they push into a niche. I feel like if you mix Adrian and Michael, you'll get the best alpha, quantitative and qualitative. Uh, what about what about you, Tina? Look at this, you know, who new profile, who this? Congrats who on this? personal profile. Thank today. you, thank you. <laughs> I do want to welcome Randy, but let's go to Gary first. I know Randy has a little time with us today, so let's go to Randy after Gary. But what's up, Gary? Hey, 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 I'm really glad to be in the space. Thanks, Aaron and Tina, for hosting. Uh, obviously, this is a great panel. Um, Randy, I'm curious about her inputs. And Michael, I just heard yours, so I'll respond to yours in a moment. But let me give a special shout out to uh, Adrian. Uh, first time to share a space, but uh, I think we're friends uh, for some time now. Introduced at Gary Cardone's uh, birthday party at his house. And then later, we coordinated to where uh, he was in Miami. Him and another person were in Miami. Um, and I brought him up to Valuetainment to meet, uh, I think he might've met, uh, PBD then, but then after that, a different wealthy guy, a billionaire in banking, uh, actuarial mind, uh, you know, more about like, you know, the Harvard business profile of how to evaluate asset classes and someone like Adrian's able to speak to that kind of uh, caliber very well because he talks about, uh, Bitcoin, not because of Bitcoin's history of 15 years and it's, you know, it's design but about like, what are people looking at? And I think that's part of like the BlackRock story, the, you know, the, the other participants in the ETF story, the Michael Saylors. It is to me going to change a bit now that the ETF is, ETF pro products are available. And I say that because we've had three years on average of a bear with about a year of a bull as a cycle uh, normal. And now, at least as far as like the leading indicator of the entire sector of cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, uh, you know, those assets under management still are generating fees. They're generating fees for three years of a bear. You can have part of your 401k. You can have part of your retirement thesis. You can be solicited by your advisor to put, you know, one to three percent of your entire wealth portfolio into Bitcoin. And I think that that's uh, part of that reason that they will advertise. They'll advertise during the bear, uh, you know, that this is a quote unquote safer product. When he speaks, when Adrian speaks to uh, Gary, I, I hope he, uh, Cardone, I think you'll comment. I hope that Adrian will comment that uh, Gary's not comfortable with self custody, really. Like he is more comfortable calling a broker and saying, hey, I know that I've got leverage, but uh, I need another day on my margin. I, I you know, it's, it's that kind of, participant more in the ETF than Joe, uh, you know, Joe uh, Norm, you know, Joe, Joe Regular, really, in the ETF. That's really going to set the tone of marketing, I think. Uh, and then let me finish with uh, what Michael had said, which is he had said something that kind of um, seemed a little odd to me, uh, and, and I would like more explainer later, about the idea of a prolonged bear. Um, that's almost like, to me, like a bleeds it leads, like that's an attention kind of uh, – uh, headline more, that we will see you know, more and more, not just from Michael, but I think we'll see a lot of that. Just people like interested in quote unquote alpha, like this time it's going to be different. And uh, I don't know because happenings are, you know, uh, a certain number of blocks apart and you know, on average four years and you know, presidential cycles definitely impact the stock market and the stock market definitely impacts the leverage positions in crypto. So like the idea of a five-year bear, I, I don't see that. I, I, I do see something's playing out similar because more people are looking at same charts, which are led by Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, people that have portfolios to manage will distribute across like, this is the frontier. These are, these are NFTs. This is a new L1, whatever it is to be on the frontier. But like uh, most people in my age group, especially, uh, we're like, we don't want to play, we want to play more conservative. And so I think Bitcoin will benefit from that. So that's my input. Thank you. And you guys, as much as I love Bitcoin, I feel like we got to move the segment along. Let's go to alt. Let's talk about the next narrative. What's going on? I mean, to me, it looks like the next narrative right now. It looks like we're in an era of airdrops. Airdrops just been great source of money in the space. I feel like, um, you see all different chains. I feel like it was mostly Solana, but I would love to get your guys' takes on it. What are what, what are the narratives that you're watching this cycle? Randy, I would love to hear from you first, and then action. We'll go to action. 
Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to see everyone up here, all friends of mine. So it's like very warm up here. Um, you know, I think I sorry I came in a little bit late, but um, altcoins. You know, I, I'm very bullish on the whole space. Um, I love Bitcoin. I think it's a great store of value, and I just think that you know, looking into the bull market. It's, you know, Bitcoin, it might price out a few people because of the gas fees. Same with Ethereum. Um, there's a little bit of a scaling issue there. So I'm very excited to see in the bull market, like, are Layer 2s going to be the solution for your people? Are there going to be new blockchains that come about that are able to scale? Or are we going to be utilizing things like, you know, like Omnilite or, you know, the Dogecoin blockchain, which people are literally putting games on top of the blockchain now. So I'm very excited to see what people's expectations are going to be, what their the idea of NFTs is going to turn turn into whether we're going to go more the inscription route or are we okay with like the current ETH kind of narrative where we have um, either IPFS hosting our images and we're okay with metadata basically being on the blockchain instead of the actual images and Web3 gaming I think is a huge narrative going into the bull market as well and the future of crypto really because I think a lot of people when you know I speak to people all the time about like you know people that have no idea what this stuff is and even older people um i was speaking i was at a family event i was speaking to a woman that's 60 years old and for her what made it click for her crypto after me talking about it for five years was nfts um and she loved the idea of like okay if she buys a book which she buys books all the time on the apple store that she could transfer it she could resell it after if she wants to do that and basically rent it out if was she this conversation Sorry to interrupt. Was this conversation like recent or was this during the NFT boom of 2021 or? No, this was literally two weeks ago. Like this conversation. Interesting. Was, yeah, this was like a few weeks ago. I've been talking to like my family and the friends about it for like five years, six years. And they all thought I was crazy up until like the past few years, but no conversations were really had until two weeks ago with one person. Um, so like what made it click for her was like NFTs and books and, and gaming where like, obviously she saw my cousins growing up that all they were doing was spending thousands of dollars between them on digital characters with their PS4s, their Xboxes. And every time they bought something, it basically went to zero because if you're buying a skin in a game in web two. You can't do anything with it. You can't rent it. You can't resell it. When, you know, a lot of these kids, they they play games and they get sick and tired of them after a while. Why can't they continue to benefit from a game they're not playing? Um, and just like authenticity, proof of ownership was really a great point that she liked as well, knowing like if she buys a book, how many are really out there, which mint number does she own, and kind of the value that way as well. Thank you, Randy. And you brought up a few points that I would like to touch on. Um, one was, you know, layer twos. And I know that Ethereum just had an upgrade. So that would be nice to talk about because um, from what I understand, it's well, supposed Ethereum, to reduce... Ethereum. Go ahead. Ethereum's upgrade. They're, they're doing it on the test net right now. It's it's close to launching for sure. The, the Dencoon upgrade. Oh, so it's not launched yet, but it's supposed to lower fees only on layer twos, not Ethereum, right? It's supposed to, as I understand it, make layer two uh, fees and usability uh, a lot more friendlier, which, you know, ipso facto would, uh, you know, be good for Ethereum. You know, Vitalik back in 2023 called the EIP 4844 or the Deacon upgrade. In 2023, he, he kind of like referred to it as like the last big upgrade before we can finally call Ethereum done, which was, you know, kind of shocked the world. Now, obviously, it got delayed in true Ethereum fashion. And uh, obviously, there's more uh, development after the fact, but, you know, his only point was like, you know, this is like one of the last big things that we wanted to do. Yep, exactly. And there is ERC 404 too, which is, I guess, for NFTs. Dang it. I was, I was just about oh, to say it. Oh, go ahead, Michael. I was go waiting. ahead. Give it to us. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So there's a brand new narrative that's coming up. Uh, it was based off of... Uh, I, it just recently happened. It's ERC-404, but it's not an EIP, so it's not EIP-404. So basically, they just streamlined past it. Um, but what it is, is basically allows it for the composability of fungible and non-fungible tokens into one standard. So similar to like 1155s, but 1155s and the differentiation with 404s is that 404s allows it to also utilize more of like the DeFi product. So the current 404 pool allows it to where, let's say if there's a generative 
10,000 mint, right? Let's say there's a 10,000 mint. Uh, what happens is that if you own one full token, you're able to receive the NFT that's going to be there. Um, so you, you'll be able to mint the NFT. But what happens is if you buy and you place under uh, one full token for that, you then go into what basically the, the NFT will then uh, disperse and disappear from your wallet. It will basically be able to claw back that portion. Um, so anything that's you, it, it's really going to be great for like anything that's going to be uh, identity based. I, I feel like because the reason why is because you're able to have an identity and the longer that you're having the associated airdrops or whichever that's going to be included in there as part of like timestamps, as long as you're owning one full token, you're able to still keep the NFT and all the additional drops with it. So let's say, for example, if I minted a board ape and later on, you know how mutant apes came. So like someone could also own, you know, a, a, a board ape, but then isn't able to read the, uh, isn't able to receive the mutant ape at that time because they sold portion of the NFT or like fractionalize it or so. But this now allows liquidity markets to be opened up onto uh, NFT pairings. So you don't have to, it's similar to like fractionalization. Yeah, of so NFTs, I wanted to ask you what's the difference because I know we had fraction, fractionalization of NFTs before. So I kind of want to know like how, what is the advantage to having like combining now the ERC, you know, 720 with 20s and kind of, you know, just providing it? What is the difference with, with the fractionalization? Uh, the fractionalization area. So, like, usually you'll have a custodial, and the custodial will then issue what is the fractionalization of it. So, if I have Board Ape 102, and I want to fractionalize it, the company then creates a pool that fractionalizes it into 100 pieces, 1,000 pieces or so. But this one, uh, with 404s, you're able to not have to worry about having a custodial fraction, uh, fractionalize it. And also for that, too... You, you have it to where it's denominated so, in so one, uh, big ten one big difference is one big difference is it's non-custodial yeah so like if let's say the custodial gets hacked and your board ape then gets transferred to a hacker's wallet you know there's no way to to kind of claw that back even if you have the fractionalization tokens those markets are now completely dead right because you can't use it to redeem the actual assets that's on there while the other uh, while with 404s once you hit a certain threshold which is you know, one full token. Um, so if it's a 10,000 generative mint, there's 10,000 total tokens. So if you read, uh, if you have one full token, you're able to actually own the NFT. You can either have it claimed or sometimes it actually just airdrops to your wallet, depending on uh, which projects they are. I like, I know for like Pande uh, Pandora, I believe was one of them, but Pandora is the first one to do it, but there's like five of them or so that's uh, currently doing it. Some of them are able to automate it to where it sends it on there. Uh, some of them aren't. But basically what happens is that you can also denominate it now all the way down to the 10th decimal. So if you don't have a full one, it can claw back and take that NFT back away from you. If you have a full one, you then own an NFT. So let's say I had a full one, create... but I sell half of it, then it's going to just disappear from my wallet? It disappears, but you still have 0.5 in terms of the coin. So anyone that's within the pool with all the other NFTs, so the whole 10,000 generative mint, all of the other ones that are in the LP, you're still able to cash out on that portion. Yeah, pretty cool. Gary, what's up? I have some things to add to that. So yeah, so that was a great explainer, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, so that's some of the interesting things that are happening on Different EBMs, different L1s, uh, including the one that I'm, you know, Aaron gave a shout out. I like Pulse Chain, but I like a lot of stuff. So uh, NFTs hasn't been something that Richard uh, Hart has ever really promoted. He's had his bash about it on the last cycle, but it is one of the more popular things on Pulse Chain right now. And it is because of one of the new technologies of this 404 that is actually, there's several platforms now that exist where it is composables. And so you were saying something earlier about like fractionalization of an NFT. You know, that could have been four or five guys putting money into a common pot and saying, we're going to buy a, a board, a yacht club guy, right? So I know several people. Uh, or you could have something that's more formalized that you don't have to know your friend that is co your one NFT. Yeah, yeah, that's like breaking up a little bit. That's been right the past, that now, sorry. But now, can can you hear me any better? It's internet. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, yeah we no, just no, don't no. want to miss a minute, man. This is good stuff. 
Yeah, so can you hear me now? Oh, can, you can you hear me? We, we okay. could hear you. We could hear you clear. Uh, so it just wasn't that compos- clear. It could be this. Okay. The composability... Yeah, the composability is a very interesting feature, very similar to what has, you know, and maybe this is a technology that does uh, kickstart a narrative for this particular cycle, like, uh, you know, DEXs of Uniswap was DeFi summer in the last cycle, or, you know, new L1s with a smart contract ability of Ethereum being the cycle before. So maybe, possibly, this NFT thing is going to be part of that. Uh, you can basically build up like in Illustrator or uh, these uh, graphics uh, softwares, you can have layers and you can buy and sell the layer that is part of the composition. So you want to have an NFT that has uh, eyeglasses or or laser beams coming out of the eyes, and then you want to have a different shirt or a different hat or whatever it is. You can either assemble your NFT, compose it, and then sell that whole item basically for the speculative value of what it costs to assemble uh, or you can sell the parts you can you can break it down later so like the fractionalization thing is very interesting and i've already seen a lot of revenue generated by these platforms uh that are just hosting the ability for 404 so it is an interesting tech it's something uh, really pay attention to both on polygon or you know other platforms that are lower cost like you were saying something about uh, you know, uh, uh, layer twos. I think that that might be a good kickstart. As uh, I've mentioned to Aaron before, I'm going to the uh, Trump uh, dinner at Mar-a-Lago and it's mostly NFT people, if not all NFT people that are going to be there. And so like, this is just like brand capital IP opportunity for cold contact and bring people into cryptocurrencies, even though we're talking about JPEGs on the internet. I think there's three standards to probably everyone should look at. So, ERC-1155, that one is probably going to be really, really great for gaming. So it's, it's kind of like how Gary was saying, where you, you attach a uh, glasses on there, you attach some equipment, you know, some items on there. So these uh, NFTs are then placed under. Um, so you can sell it as a bundle. You know, think of like selling a, a, a character in-game that you just leveled up at the end, you know, all, all the way to level 90 or whatever, and you can kind of sell all of his, uh, his, his skin, his weapon, re his uh, inventory and everything um the next standard was uh, erc 6551 so this one's more of like token bound accounts so for for the token bound account portion you're able to have ne- similar to like nested nfts under it but you can also have an nft own a ethereum wallet so it's really great for identity Think of it as like if you have a board ape and you're like hey i want to be able to sign a transaction based off of my board ape and it, your board ape can literally own a OX wallet, and then you just add a, a DNS to it, or a, I mean, the ENS to it, to say, hey, board ape signer or something, right? Uh, to actually have it facilitate and sign a transaction based off of owning that NFT. Now, the bad thing is, if you sell, <laughs> if you sell that NFT, <laughs> and it's inside that token bound account, or you sell the token bound account, you're basically selling everything. But what I also see as a use case for it is. Similar to uh, like acquisitions of companies, whenever you're acquiring a company, you need to get all of their information, all their bank accounts, all of their accounts that are going to be set under it. This can now allow for you know multi accounts to be owned. So like if you're running a hedge fund and you're going to get acquired by a bigger entity, you have all of your uh, accounts basically under like an organizational hierarchy of it. So you can just basically sell the entire bundle. And for 404, 404 is still super super new. I mean it's Michael, it's Michael. Michael, this is good stuff, but let's uh, let's wrap up in 60 seconds because I do want to bring Burb back in here if he has any comments. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, 404 is brand new, so just think of it as like the speculative DJ and play. But a, a lot of Layer 1s and Layer 2s right now, especially airdrop season, all these things are happening. you got to remember that the, the Layer Wars are coming back. Uh, a lot of the Layer 1s raised a crap ton of money during the bear market, so they do have a lot of runway to kind of push and especially right now it's going to be their fresh narrative to uh to push into the ecosystem thank you michael and i do want to change the segment um verb i want to get your thoughts on this i feel like it's an elephant in the room you know it's usually i'm openly supporting solana in this space i'm a fan of solana but we got to talk about it you guys we got to talk about it going down again after about a year the big question is, is this something to be alarmed about? Is this something to worry about? What are your thoughts, Adrian? I have some thoughts, but <laughs> I would love to hear from you. All right. Thanks. Uh, 
Well, this is a good fucking question, right? So first of all, <laughs> this is this is something that shouldn't be happening, yet it's happening. So uh, it sucks, but it is what it is. I, you know, I'm here in for for the techno. No, I'm, I'm fucking kidding. I'm here for the money. I'm, I'm here to make money as an investor, right? So I, I don't I don't really care what the name of you know what the name of the token is, as long as it's you know AML compliant and so on. I'm here to make money. And uh, if it if the network gets congested, if the network is stuck, it sucks, right? Because you are a profit maximalist. A profit maximalist. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's debatable, right? Because eventually, it's risk adjusted returns that matter. It's like a sharp ratio, so tina ratio, train duration, all this stuff. So, risk adjusted returns, yes. Uh, profits alone, if it's super volatile, not really, right? Because it's not sustainable. So, long story short, you know, Solana Solana breaking up, you know, is. Uh, is uh, is a second rendition of something that already happened, right? Uh, I'm not gonna give you the details, you know, on why it happened and so on because I'm ignorant. I have no fucking clue what that happened, right? I, I should probably ask some smarter people like Randy or Gary to to, to talk to talk about that. Um, in terms of in terms of the overall trends, right? I like observing the trends. There's there's a positive trend in Solana, of course. There was one of the very strong positive breakups overall, you know, that it that it rallied off. So it empowers people, and uh, there are a lot of there is a lot of probably blockchain related, like I said, difficulties that we that, that we have from the um, network there. That is just basically making it impossible to use over the long term, right? Blockchain is not supposed to like imagine the bank using a blockchain, right? Visa is using you know if, if you're in smart contracts and so on, to the best of my understanding, for four years already. And they use blockchain internally, externally to facilitate lower transaction fees and so on. What was that? And that sounds like a mic coming really unplugged, and he, he's not realizing it's been unplugged yet. Yep, yeah, that's yeah. the sound of it. Adrian, your mic oh, back. Sorry, it got me off. Did you guys hear me? No worries, we can hear you now. Okay. Start over. Some, someone, 30 seconds. Me. someone muted me. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not good. Imagine Visa kind of like just getting, getting ruined and getting fucked because the network you know, that I used just went down. So it's, uh, so it's not good. What, what can I say? It sucks. <laughs> That's all. Action, let's hear it. I mean, the, pr the price didn't go really go down that much. This is kind of par for the course. It's, you know, congruent with how everybody in crypto thinks of Solana. Aaron, it was the opposite. All it right. pumped, right? Like, right after it came back, everybody was like, oh, it's yeah, going to yeah, dump. No, it just took off. I mean, it's, it, 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 people made money. Um, and you're right. To yeah, I was in a space. Go ahead, Gary. Well, you I was guys, in a space yesterday with, uh, with Moby Media and uh, Digital, and it was all about Solana. There's a lot of content that's about, like, Solana. And the, the, the highlight was what you guys both said. The price goes down because there's a five-hour outage. The price you know, surges back up, at, whether it's supported by VC or just enthusiasts or speculators. People are here for price. So, like, I don't see it as a long-term harm other than it's not really fitting what blockchain is or, like, the permanence or anything like that. Like, the narrative of why are you in blockchain it, yeah, it sounds great that it's permissionless, borderless, uh, you know, we're going to have a Bitcoin standard. That, to me, sounds nice, but really people are here for money. Like, they want price performance more yeah, than Yeah, more than, than server performance, right? And you were right, you know, like, the last time it went down was February 2023, and on the 25th, and that was out for, like, almost 19 hours, almost a whole day, which is ridiculous. But if you go back in history, like, it was off, like, uh, 2022, October, September, I'm just browsing the calendar in June. Like this thing went went down a lot. May, April. Like this is not. Uh, I guess you can call it a lot. It's no Litecoin, right, Randy? Um, <laughs> um, but 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 again, money talks. Money talks, and people are willing to put their money in it because guess what? It's you know mostly funded by VCs, and there is no room for a normie um, or even somebody starting out when it comes to Solana. Find a token, maybe running a validator, forget it. Like the specs that, you, that are required, like even your internet connection. Like I don't know anybody that has you know the speed to be able to maintain. Um, that type of server is just unheard of. So, like, I much rather focus on the altcoin, um, altcoins out there that will make me money. And I appreciate Michael. You're the man for talking about airdrops. I mean, you made me some good chunk of change, um, especially in the Cosmos ecosystem. And I just saw Tempe leave. I was about to give him a shout out. Um, 
like they're launching a new token and I'm getting airdrops for those because I know enough to look around to figure out exactly what's happening in those ecosystems. I think that's a really good way for people to like rake in a little bit of cash and basically find out about what else is out there. You know, mining is also a good, good play in my book. Like you saw Casper take off this morning. You got a nice little pump with Casper. There, there's a lot of opportunities out there and we got to look around. It's not just the main players. Yes, Solana is nice. They're going to make money hand over fist because of the people that are involved. But ultimately, if you want to see like really large returns, well, you got to go for the little guys. Like there's a lot more opportunity at risk. Absolutely. But the opportunity, like it's endless and that's why i mentioned like a new, new token from tempe like i was just talking about you know um getting but i'm still going to stick around and mine you know um with quantum like i was talking about with adrian being a partner over there like it, some of these things you just got to do it like you got to follow through the basics and then look for the gems follow through the basics look you're, for really, the you're really pumping quantum today I, yeah. dude they're paying me i'm totally kidding i wish i was getting paid out i got stock though i got stock options I'm pretty open about this I stuff. I don't care. Like, I'm, I'm not shilling, shilling anybody else's bags. I, I am shilling mine. One Adrian, because Adrian, Adrian I think, gets something too. That's right. Love it, you guys. Well, I feel like there's this different perspectives for sure. I mean, a, a theory that I saw that, you know, kind of was like why this even happened was because the, uh, the Jupiter airdrop, it actually, people think that it actually put a lot of capacity testing on the Solana network. So the chain had over 600,000 people at the same time at the time of the airdrop and it went on for an hour. So if you're a Solana Maxi, in your opinion, that kind of looks not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but in my opinion, you know, being a Solana fan, I think that they need to do better. The chain isn't a new chain anymore. It's not in beta mode anymore. Lots of money is going into it. And, you know, it's just not games anymore. I feel like reality is institutions, corporations, they're not going to want to trust to build on something that might go down and, you know, prone to attacks and such. I know that, you know, a reason that Action mentioned it was going down so much before. And I know that, you know, um, the thing that they did that helped with it, that stopped it that going down so much. And why was it going down? Because the fee was so low that you can attack it with billions and billions of transactions at the same time. So as a solution, they came up with the localized fee market so that every application would kind of have, have a localized fee market and it wouldn't be able to crash the network. So when they implemented this, you know, we thought that they solved the problem of Solana going down. But now it feels like there is more problems. So I think they just need to do better at this point. Um, I still like the tech, but um, I would love to hear um, from Randy as well. I know, Randy, you're probably not going to be a fan of this. Give it to us. And Tina, I'm sorry. I thought it was FTX. Yeah, so, you know, I... I have like, you know, basically the opposite uh, kind of opinion, which I think is, ki is kind of cool because, you know, everyone has their different opinions and such. Uh, you know, my perspective is if people, you know, we're tokenizing things, tokenization is the future. And if people have gaming assets that are worth thousands of dollars or real estate deeds or medical information that is on this blockchain and they have to rely on it essentially. And if they wake up one morning and they need this valuable information or they need to move their assets and it's not available, that's a huge issue. If you're trading on Solana, you're trading these meme coins, obviously you can't trade them and you can't make any profit if the thing doesn't work. And even if it does turn back on, how many times is it going to go down before the devs tell you that they can't turn it back on? My other thing is, if you're here for money and making money, it sounds great. But depending on what country you're in, what like you know, if you're making profits off of trading, one, you're putting it in the bank. There's a global financial crisis. NYCB is on the verge of failure. We had five bank failures in the United States last year. What if you wake up and your bank fails and you can't get into your magical little banking app? It just doesn't work out. And then you have the whole fiat thing, right? If you're in a country like, let's say, Argentina that has triple-digit inflation, then if you're trading and making profits and putting it back into your fiat currency, it's devalued almost instantly. It's a little slower in the United States and other first-world countries, but it's still something that's valid, that people are trading, they're making profits, they're putting it in the bank, and their fiat's being devalued. So in my opinion, I'm the complete opposite. I'm here for peer-to-peer -peer interactions, censorship-resistant transactions, cross-border, and most importantly, not having something that's going to be devalued and has a finite supply like Bitcoin with 21 million, Litecoin with 84 million, and something, again, that's reliable. Litecoin's the longest-running blockchain with no downtime. Bitcoin's right behind it. So, yeah, 
Those are my opinions. All right, Bitman, y'all got to send Randy an L7 just for that comment right there. You guys, I'm not going off mute because Michael, jump in. Gary, jump in anytime you like. Don't You don't have to raise hands. I, I have some issues with Solana. Those oh, yeah, go ahead, Gary. Randy made, uh, Randy made some really good commentary. And again, it goes to like the philosophy of the individual. Uh, I think like you can say your portfolio needs to be very conservative because you're a different place in life. Uh, you're, you're less risk taking or whatever it is as far as your psychology. Uh, you can say that you're in cryptocurrency just to, you know, like I said, be a profit maximalist, uh, no matter the volatility. So it's, it, it goes to the perspective, right? The idea in my mind about Solana is VC and, uh, you know, FTX and the history of it going, you know, turned off manually or turned off by accident or by code. By code is one thing. Uh, but like you see price performance, people that bought dips made money. People that, uh, you know, I think that the Chai Math and the, the three billionaire guys that make their stream constantly, they talk about buying at $10 and selling at a hundred. So like, you know, they make their money. Um, and that's part of the idea is, is, is it centralized enough that it can be uh, a, a stand in for the New York stock exchange, right? So I've, I've heard narratives around Solana would be the blockchain choice. Uh, Coinbase may be the, the holder for ETF uh, money and, and as far as coins and things like that. So that's centralized that uh, Solana has this uh, ability to you know, transact for Visa and MasterCard. Like these things already have circuit breakers. The New York Stock Exchange, if it drops a certain percentage, then it gets turned off. You can't trade anymore. And people don't have an issue really with that, right? Uh, or they'll do uh, uh, outside trading so or OTC. So like there's going to be a narrative. There's going to be differentiation across all the different blockchain choices that you have. If you like Bitcoin for certain characteristics, uh, I would like if you guys do end up talking about Monero being delisted from uh, Binance. That was a, a highlight yesterday with Seth, which is Mind Your Biz, uh, you know, basically making that point uh, in relationship to Solana. Like you're going to choose the flavor that you like because your the characteristics or your philosophy supports it you know and you know that's another thing about philosophy gary that like i think is pretty like in one way or another hypocritical uh from a lot of the exchanges that are delisting things like monero and you know you can argue whatever but privacy is a basic human right and i feel like everyone should be entitled to that and like if you look at the standards of binance and they were talking about like providing a good environment for the community network stability if they really cared about standards then why didn't they delist solana for going down 11 or 12 times you know, like if they really cared about standards, they would hold every other cryptocurrency on their platform up to that standard. To me, it just seems like an attack on privacy and an attack on your rights. Preach! Guys, I'd like to jump in real quick. In our final five to ten minutes, I want to leave this community, the audience right here, with the most alpha possible. Uh, you know, I want to encourage everybody in our audience to uh, follow Gary, Randy, Tina, Michael, Crypto Burb, Action. Thank you guys all for being with us this past hour. So the question I want to put out to you, but, you know, you could take it in any direction you want. Can you give us any sort of alpha, even DGEN alpha, even like airdrop alpha or, or anything? Maybe if you're more trader oriented, do something with that. But, you know, as we get to everybody's final statements, leave the community with some alpha. All right. I feel like this is speaking to me. Uh, quick thing on the the Jupiter thing. So Jupiter was selling in open market. So it was basically like an all all public sale. So that's why like the price of it dropped like 60%. Um, it's just because the, the team was liquidating uh, while the market was going up. So there's some issues there. But it, in terms of alpha, I mean... To give some context, I was previously in uh, Karma DAO back in 2020 when uh, Shiba Inu was actually being created. And so I, I, I kind of do know some of the founders and, you know, we're not going to name names or anything. But there's a brand new L2 that's coming out called Ryoshi Network. Uh, it's supposed to combat Shibarium. Shibarium has a little bit of drama, but this one's going to be on... Uh, it's going to be a Polygon CDK chain that's going to utilize uh, utilize SHIB as gas, and SHIB is actually going to be burnt as part of the you're, transactions. You're talking about a new L2 for Shiba Inu. Yep, 
so it's finally able to because like the the first portion is like if you look at shibarium it's like bone and leash right bone and leash was used to be a fuel in the ecosystem but the the big thing was that the burns were actually something that uh, everyone wanted uh the burns actually over time just started uh, it not really starting to get burnt like it was just starting to be hold, uh, held in the walls and then everyone started changing but this one every transaction will actually burn shiba inu so portion portion of it gets burnt portion of it is uh used as gas fee so it makes it to where shiba inu is more uh more utilized within the ecosystem and is it's evm alpha, compatible is the alpha for the shiba inu token specifically or for the token that this l2 creates that already both? pumped i think right shiba is in like the top 18 or so um they the, the token hasn't the other token the governance token hasn't came out yet so everyone's kind of like waiting on that side so that's my alpha uh, is, that just, the, is, is that the alpha though that like there's opportunity in this new l2 well yeah because like if you look at every time that a l2 comes out l2 always has like multiple multiple faucets that come out so like the uh if you look at like um Let's say, for example, you're going to need a DEX, you're going to need an NFT marketplace, you're going to need to have aggregators, you're going to have to have a DeFi ecosystem be built out of it. From there, there's always arbitrage opportunities for arbitraging on-chain, but then there's also uh, opportunities for yield farming. Yield farming was probably the, the only way that DEXs are able to compete against centralized exchanges with liquidity. So having it to where uh, you're, you're, you're going through the yield farming phase, you're going through the meme coin phase as well. Like Shiba Inu is one of the top memes, like meme tokens in the world um, behind Dogecoin. So I would say with that ecosystem, having it EVM compatible, you're able to now have other, I would say like it's going to be a meme frenzy of, uh, of tokens being launched. But every brand new L2 has that happen, right? Like, even if you're looking at some of the ones on uh, on Solana, like you look at Analos, you look at Bonk, and then you look at Knob. I see, I see. Uh, you're saying the ecosystem in general, there's going to be new... Michael, new I feel like you're holding out the good stuff. Mm. You, Action said you had some alpha for airdrops. I did, I yeah, he always has them. I don't them. know what you're farming. I don't know. Uh, airdrops? Airdrops? Injective? Inge I think Injective, there was a DYM um, Dimension just kind of like had their airdrop. There's another one that I just came across today. It's from the Cosmos ecosystem. It is called N Nibiru. Yeah, Nibiru chain. Nitar and they're doing Nitaro like a chain is what you're thinking about. That's Tempe, bro. I'm glad you found it. No, N B I R U. Dude, that, that was an attempted at show. Don't mess, don't mess me up. Thank you, Michael. Nah, Thank nah, nah. You. Let's let's open it up to maybe action if you have something different or Gary or Randy or, or Burb, anybody. I think you got to keep it simple, right? Like that's the whole thing. I think that the, when I started doing the whole um, farming of airdrops, the reason why I was, you know, profitable in it is because I didn't overcomplicate it. And it's real easy for anybody in the space that's just trying to get started like with airdrops or anything, just trying to make money. When, and when you say farming... airdrop is that simply using the chain to hope for an airdrop in the future? a little bit more than that so like holding um other specific tokens that qualify you for airdrops um a right chain for example i freaking love a right chain because of that um and being in that platform has allowed me to farm a lot of different things so it's just getting connected like finding out that there is more um to the space than just numbers i'm um, sorry sorry adrian but like it you know that that social aspect of it does matter sometimes and um it, it's not what um what the charts will show it's why some sometimes the charts will move. It's because they are deploying things that will get that exposure. I mean, look at Kulu, what they did with Polygon. It's like incredible how many people they were able to airdrop to. Like that stuff makes a difference. And um, the sentiment changes when you're able to get that kind of exposure. Um, and it's just exciting to, to see that, you know, even us dum-dums that can't read charts like Adrian can sometimes win by looking at the social aspect of things. I'm the dumb-dumb, the, 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 dumb, dumb, by the way, just, just putting that up there. How did the Kulo airdrop work in brief? I don't understand. Um, they identified a few token holders, like if you ever transact with a few different places, and they did the biggest airdrop in Polygon history, basically, is what happened there. And like if you had interacted with a few different tokens, they were able to uh, capture your wallet address, and all of a sudden, you got Kulo. And ev what, were the, what were the tokens? Um, I don't have a list of that. I mean, Moon Daddy would be the one to, to kind of go through that, uh, and Seth, but... Um, it, it was Moon pretty Daddy wide. Is founder of Kulo? Yes, he is. Oh, cool. I didn't know.
Yeah, so we'll, we'll either see him beat somebody up or get, you know, punched in the face um, very soon as well. I think another piece of yeah, you said biggest airdrop in Polygon history. I think there's another one that's probably going to be coming up shortly that will probably outpace it. I, I completely agree, and that's the thing. Like, If you understand the narrative and how this works, you're going to be looking out for that. Um, they did do a really cool thing. Now people are going to try to beat it, and that's what I want to see because when that happens, we all win. Let's hear from Gary. Yeah, there's, there's one that's been anticipating for like about a month, so... Yeah, so... What's the project? Um, well, just let Michael say the name of the project, then we'll go to Gary. It's uh, going to be Reaper. They, they've been doing some crazy stuff uh, in terms of, like, uh, killing bots and kind of, like, rewarding the community and everything. But uh, it's supposed to aggregate, like, I think six communities together, <laughs> and they're going to be able to do an airdrop to Kulo. Uh, I think it was... Uh, it was Kulo, Squid Grow. It was um, J uh, Junji... Uh, there's like six of them that they're going to be airdropping to their community. And hand, take a look at what's next to Michael's name. Oh, Poly Doge, Saiyan Pepe. So yeah, these are all the projects Michael is loves or you know is working with. I'm I'm a Michael. polygon next. He only picks the best. <laughs> Gary, Gary, you go. Yeah, thanks again for hosting the space. I always like this dialogue. Uh, everyone having their perspective as far as like TA, uh, you know, like the nor the the reference points of the crypto industry of like Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, and then all of the derivatives. You know, the people that are on the frontier taking the most risk of getting shot with an arrow. Like you're like, oh no, I shouldn't have done that land claim. You know, it was it was a hostile territory. So I like that everyone kind of uh, brings their perspective to the space. Um, as far as like, you know, I don't know if it's alpha. You know, people know that I like Pulse Chain. I like. Uh, I think about 10% of my portfolio is Bitcoin, probably about 40% is Ethereum. So like, just because I talk about Pulse Chain itself doesn't mean that I'm a maxi. Uh, I try to be a bridge across all the different industries. Um, I like that when I bought Ethereum, it was uh, like $80, $75 or $80. I think the lowest purchase for Bitcoin was like 3300 or 3400 something like that. And I feel like... Uh, 2018 have, days. Yes, yes, exactly. So I haven't been in this industry that long, just in other instruments uh, outside of cryptocurrency. Um, but I do like that everything that's on Ethereum, as far as its Lindy effect, everything that has, uh, you know, some use case of a DEX or liquidity or NFTs or whatever exists uh, on Pulse Chain. And I like the new builders that basically don't have the favoritism from Richard. Uh, like these composable NFTs and, uh, you know, leverage platforms and things like that, that he usually rails against. They're still building. They're building their permissionless and uh, getting traction. So 200 or so products or pr platforms are on that particular chain. And I think it's kind of the same narrative as going to an L2 or anything else. What's great is there's no bridge costs. If people are bringing a capital across, then they're bringing it for free versus L2s. And uh, I think that, you know, basing it on Ethereum's, seven or eight year uh, developer history is a good thing. So that's where I'm sticking at on my alpha. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Dave, what's up, Dave? What's up, Tina? Aaron, what's good? Thanks for having We've me. We missed you. I missed you guys too, man. Been a little bit busy, been a little bit busy, but uh, let's drop some alpha. Y'all remember the alpha I dropped last time, right? Pshh. Come on now. How could we forget? How could we forget? It's, it's been ringing my ears from the exactly. day for days. Exactly. So, additions to that eco to the Stacks ecosystem. You ready? Dico, D I K O, that is uh, going to be another self repaying loan platform. Um, not so much competition to the Alex platform, but still this fairly new. The, this is in the ecosystem Bitcoin more ecosystem, more Stacks specifically the Stacks ecosystem. Correct. Stacks layer two of Bitcoin. You got it. Um, there's also another swap site. It's STSW. It's called Stack Swap. Um, it's got, I mean, small, like, Little liquidity, right, compared to like the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem, but compared to the rest of the chains, forget it. Um, o R N J. Um, it is a it's a DeFi solution um, with a wallet. Now that is a Bitcoin. <clears throat> that's the actual ordinal. Um, and then the final one, Rabi, which is a like a pure wallet play. Still doesn't have a token. So if you download it, it's R A B B Y, the Rabi wallet. Um, it supports, I think it's almost, they're up to a hundred chains now, both mainnet and testnet. Um, 
for the average, you know, Joe or Jane, you're probably going to be good with that one. Um, and you actually get to no more revoke.cash. You can actually revoke permissions directly from this wallet. It's kind of integrated, which is cool. And again, they have not done an airdrop yet. So the more you use this thing, more points you rack up. Maybe you get yourself an airdrop. Boom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You um, Good alpha, sir. Adrian, I want to go to you before we close this space. Any alpha you can give us? Only beta. Only beta and sigma this time. So three, three points. Uh, it's, it's market technicals that drive the sentiment. Sentiment is a result of what people see in the charts, not the other way around, right? It's people getting bullish because they see charts, not charts getting bullish because people see things. It, eventually, one turns into another. However, the source of it is that because rely on benchmarks, rely on what they see, rely on different opinions, and this is how they build their own opinion. This is your, your, your uh, irrational world we live in. And so relying on the charts basically sets us apart six to nine months ahead of everybody, ahead of every, every other business, ahead of everybody at media outlet and so on. Uh, anybody who, use, who don't use charts are missing out six to, six to nine months that at times on crypto are asymmetrically and geometrically uh, expensive. And my, my good friend Yona is here as well, who's an excellent, excellent chartist. Huge shout out to him. Make sure you guys follow him as well as Gary. Uh, so uh, another thing is the momentum principle and the outperforming assets will continue to outperform more likely than not, which means that you do not want to fight the trend. And when there is a trend and the trend goes 200% or 192% for Bitcoin from the lows, you don't want to counter trade it. If Solana rose, if Solana bumps 12x, 12, uh, 12, 1,000%, you know, 1,200%, whatever that is, of the lows, you don't want to trade against that, right? Because it's basically like a speeding truck that is going to run you over. So there's, it, this is just a terrible take. It's just a bad take. Uh, so trend following is the most profitable follow the trends. Trend is your friend. And last but not least, uh, Warren Buffett once said that the best investment you can make is investment in yourself. Because the more you learn, the more you will earn. That's what I live by. That's where I preach. That it's where I practice. Shout out to everybody. Shout out to you, Tina. Shout out to Randy, Gary, Action Dave, everybody. Uh, much love. Uh, and uh, thanks to the incredible host as well. God bless. Thank you, you. Thank you for coming. It's been great to hear your perspective. And you guys, we had such a diverse panel today. This is what I love. Just different ideas, different thoughts. And then we can you can make your own decisions. Um, Randy, I would love to get one last take from you. Any alpha you can give the audience? Alpha is being your own bank and looking into wallets that to, that you could store your crypto in because if you're not a trader and you're just keeping your crypto on the exchange, you're basically trusting like a bank. And the reason why we're in crypto is to be our own bank. So if you haven't yet, make sure you take your crypto off of the exchange. You can always send it back if you're just storing it long, ter long term. Always look at open source wallets. I think that's a huge thing right now. Transparency is key. And making sure that you never click any links that are suspicious. Don't answer any text message links, any email links. There's a lot of fishing going around right now um don't uh connect your twitter to like connect as minimal things as possible because what i'm seeing a lot with x hacks right now is people clicking on third party links connecting their x account and then from there they're able to get in and tweet whatever they want and potentially lock you out so make sure you guys look at your connected sessions make sure you guys look at delegate access on your x as well make sure no one else is able to write tweets for you um so i think that's my biggest piece of alpha right now just keep calm hot along stay zesty if you guys want to check me out um, I'm live every morning, Monday through Friday at 9.45 a.m. Eastern for the Daily Zest on YouTube, X, and everywhere else. So make sure you guys follow. Drops mic. Wow. <laughs> Dave? I, I, I don't know if any, it, can the host make a comment, just add on to what Randy said. Is it a Vest Answers that just got his Twitter hacked? Was that something about YubiKey or did he make oh. like a quick answer to yeah, that? Like, so basically I know that invest answers got hacked and I think it was because of a third party from the people I was talking to and uh, Jason Yanowitz from Blockwork, same thing. Um, I think like I got compromised um, and I think that was the reason as well because if somebody has like a connected session or whatever, like if you, let's say you connect to like a website to enter a giveaway or something like that and you never disconnect, it's like the same thing with your MetaMask where like you're logged on to OpenSea, like you're always going to disconnect that session after on your MetaMask to make sure there are no permissions given it's the same exact thing on x so if you have someone that's connected to a third party or you give them delegate access that bypasses your 2fa so it doesn't matter what kind of security you have on your account if somebody's connected if there's an app connected that's it it's dead from there 
Dave, action. Any words? Any last words? I actually got one more play for you. Um, we spoke to a Swiss giga brain this morning in the real world asset space. This one, I think, is, look, NFA, blah, 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 all those disclaimers. Uh, it's called Super State, S-U-P-E-R-S-T-A-T-E. -E. Um, it's founded by a guy named Robert Leshner. For those that are uh, geeks, you know that uh, Robert Leshner was the one who founded Compound Finance back in 2017. So this is the new venture. Just found out this morning. I don't have much more just right now, but no token as of yet, but they do have a contract address. Um, Super State. Yeah, that's all I got for you. Thank you. And Aaron, actually, let's throw it to you. Let's throw it to our host. What alpha do you have for us? All right. Uh, <clears throat> this will be the final piece of alpha. So I do just want to say again, thank you, everybody, for being a, a part of this space. Um, thank you for the, you know, the kind words, Burb. And uh, uh, everybody, I, I would like to kind of uh, piggyback off what Crypto Burb was saying. He said that one of the things he said was the trend is your friend. He's talking about the trend of the charts. I would say the trend in narratives is your friend too. You know, there's certain narratives that just last a cycle or a cycle or two. And, you know, they're largely gone after that. Not that DeFi, I mean, DeFi is still, you know, it's more than a trend. But like, you know, you guys remember in 2020 when DeFi summer was the trend. And then in 2021, NFTs, you know, you could say for this past year, airdrops certainly been a big trend. and. You know, whatever it is, I think, you know, just what's worked for me, the way I've made the most money in crypto, not only sticking around, doing just as much work and studying and taking just as much actions in the downtimes, kind of like where we're in today. I mean, it was very easy to be in crypto in December and January, running up to the ETF hype. A little bit harder nowadays. I suspect the people who are listening to this space uh, don't have a problem with this, but it's certainly very hard to be in crypto a year ago or two years ago so i mean the trend is your friend with the narrative is the way i've made you know the most money is like not being too you know uh you know against these trends it's very easy to be like this is stupid i don't want to do this this is new but just kind of like experimenting with them playing along with them i've certainly you know made some good money that way and uh just overall you know making sure within the cycle especially if this is one of your first cycles you know, have a plan to realize some profits. You don't want to go through the entire cycle realizing no profits, or or maybe your goal is oh, I want to increase my Bitcoin stack or Ethereum stack or, or whatever it is. Just make sure you have a goal. And uh, you know, that's my alpha, guys. Uh, thank you so much for for coming on the space today. It's been great. Uh, we do this space every Thursday, typically at 5 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. 8 p.m. Eastern time on Thursdays. Today we did Next a little week, bit earlier. Actually, but, uh, we'll probably be doing it like late at night. You guys, we're collabing with people from all over the world. So it gets tough to get new speakers for you if we don't change the time. So next week, actually, we have a great speaker coming on, Aaron. And it's probably going to be late at night, just so you know. All right, let's keep it a secret, though. This is a huge, huge speaker. Uh, next week, it's going to be uh, our huge guest. Uh, it's going to be good. But anyways, we'll see you next week, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. God bless. Keep it's been an amazing much. hour. You guys, I learned Thanks, so Tina. much. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, the speakers, for providing insights. Please pull up. We love hearing from you. You never know who you're going to connect with, network with, build with. Hell, I met Crypto Burb on the Polygon space last week, and we're friends now. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, just yes <laughs> so right. thank you guys and thank you so much to the speakers for coming i appreciate your time um have an amazing rest of your day wherever you are around the world much love see you next thursday and bye